and welcome to another episode of Discourse for the Religious Studies Project. My name is Savannah Finver. I am a comparative studies doctoral student at The Ohio State University, uh, working on questions of religion, law, and politics. And I will be your host for today's episode. Um, today, I am delighted to be joined by Candace Mixon and Suzanne Newcomb. Um, and I would like to turn it over to you guys really quick for introductions before we get started. So Candace, can you kick us off? Sure. My name is Candace Mixon, and I am a non-tenure track assistant professor at Occidental College in the Department of Religious Studies. My specialization is within Islamic studies, and I especially focus on Iran and devotional practices around visual and material culture in the Prophet Muhammad's family. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, Suzanne, you're up. So my name is Suzanne Newcomb. I'm a senior lecturer in religious studies at the Open University in the United Kingdom. And I'm also the honorary director of INFORM, which was um, founded to provide information on minority religious movements. And it's based at King's College London. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for being here today. I'm really excited for us to um, kick off this episode of Discourse. We are in the process of recording as a, a new administration is about to be uh, inaugurated at the, at the Capitol in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. Um, so um, this, this month of, of January, our theme for the Religious Studies Project is um, religion and politics. And it's quite fitting, I would say, given uh, the timeliness, particularly in the United States, I feel like we're hearing and seeing um, news stories pretty much continuously about uh, all different kinds of aspects and facets of religion um, in the last couple of weeks, regardless of how you get your news. If you're watching, you know, a major news publication or if you're doom scrolling on social media like I am, um, you've undoubtedly heard um, we're about to inaugurate our second. Uh, uh, openly devout Catholic president here in the U.S. Um, I'm sure you've heard about some of the um, recent uh, riots and violence on Capitol Hill and how that's connected to uh, QAnon, the group QAnon that we've been hearing a lot about on the Religious Studies Project um, and on Twitter and social media and elsewhere. Um, and it's just been really uh, so interesting how much we're seeing in the news related to religion and politics. So um, at, for to begin, I want to um, turn us over to Candace. You had some really interesting thoughts um, about some of the, how some of the violence was attributed uh, within the discourse and rhetoric that was going on within the Senate. So I'll turn it over to you and we can start off there. Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, so you're absolutely right that, you know, around the world, obviously, um, the riots, insurrection has been on TV, foreign leaders have, um, you know, denounced it and um, tried to cut ties with various forms of the current, at this moment, administration. Um, but I was really struck by some news um, related to a Republican senator from Maine, Susan Collins, who uh, the headline says that she thought that the mostly white pro-Trump mob that stormed the Capitol was the Iranians at first. And it almost feels like one can laugh, except for that one should cry at that moment. Um, that the fact that you could both publicly say, um, you know, in an interview after this event that obviously would have extreme trauma, I think, for any member of the Senate or House who was, you know, in, in those buildings at that time. Um, but to feel comfortable to publicly say, given everything that you would have already known about the events and, and kind of who was behind it, and we'll get a little bit more into that, to be able to say, oh, I at first thought the Iranians were making good on some kind of claim to invade the U.S. Capitol. Um, which, to my knowledge, is not really a claim that anybody has credibly made. Um, and uh, there is a sort of lobbying group for um, Iranian Americans called the National Iranian American Council, 
And they've called for, you know, a petition uh, or they've petitioned for an apology. And they write that her mischaracterization is part of a long history of misunderstanding and demonization that has real consequences. Because obviously, even though all Iranians are not Muslim um, by any stretch of the imagination, but it is the majority um, religion practiced, of course, in Iran and, and Shia Islam at that, um, that that the fact that, that that all gets lumped in together. And that's been something that we see um, consistently, that most Americans wouldn't be able to easily identify um, or you know, note differences between Pakistani Americans and Iranian Americans or Arab Americans or, or any other mix of ethnicity um, or religious background. And so this kind of points to this larger Islamophobic and kind of racialized um, environment in which someone like Susan Collins is living. Um, and, and kind of just wanted to open that up maybe for discussion. Um, I've got more thoughts there, but sort of thinking through or, or if you've seen maybe similar responses, um, either Suzanne or, or um, Savannah. Well, I was just mostly shocked in the article you pointed out that um, this senator was on the Senate Intelligence Committee. True, yeah. Um, it seems a bit... Um, uh, I don't know. It's really scary <laughs> that that someone who has access to all the security briefings um, would not be aware of where different threats were coming from and the different, all the different types of people and backgrounds and ideologies involved with security issues. Um, so I find that quite terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that speaks to some of the larger um, concerns that we have seen throughout uh, the current President Trump's uh, administration um, in terms of, you know, kind of inciting this uh, inciting continuous fear around um, particularly different racial groups. So um, I know that for a while, well, we had in the beginning of his administration, we had the the what people colloquially refer to as the Muslim ban. Um, and then we had, um, you know, also with regards to, you know, references to erecting the border wall, we had, um, you know, uh, racial discrimination against um, Mexicans as well. Um, so I think that this, these kinds of racial tensions and this idea of kind of um, scapegoating a particular mm -hmm. races, I, I guess, um, uh, has has been a common theme, it seems to me, in this administration. So it, it seems um, as much as it's shocking and scary, it's almost at the same time not shocking at all in a, in a way. I mean, yeah, that's another, Oh, sorry. No, go on, Sabin. Oh, no, sorry, you're... Candace. Oh, it was me, Candace. Um, it's okay. I know we're not on video. Um, one other thing I was going to mention, though, is that, you know, as Savannah was mentioning, this isn't new by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I was just reading in um, Todd Green's Islamophobia book, um, as I was prepping for some classes coming up, um, that one week after 9-11, there was the quote unquote anthrax scare um, that was sent um, to a, two senators and some news organizations and um, Five people had had died of this um, of this anthrax, um, you know, sort of scare and, and sending out this through the mail, and immediately again, a me uh, media sources went to an Al Qaeda connection, um, and later it was proven that it was someone, it was a biologist, and it had no connection to any Muslim practice. They were in no way, shape, or form connected with Islam, but the immediate presentation was that this anthrax movement. Um, had to be connected to Al Qaeda, of course, because 9-11 had just happened. And so for me also that connection of of blame shifting and sort of vague othering, othering um, you know, some sort of attack is again reinforcing the fact that the dissonance of not being able to associate um, white supremacy or ins insurrection with our people or Americans. Um, and so that was just kind of on my mind as well. But sorry, Suzanne, if you had other thoughts. Suzanne, did you want to add to that? Sorry, I, I think my internet is a bit oh, dodgy as, as we're all um, experiencing these days. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I, I missed the very end of it. But what I was thinking about as you were talking um, 
was just the low level of of kind of religious literacy or religious or literacy of of other countries and cultures and i was um brought to mind kind of old news stories of um of sikhs being killed um in america because they look like muslims um which um i think there was, there was a case in in kansas city a few years ago which is actually where i i grew up in kansas um and we we never like i never saw anyone from any other country growing up and now I live in London and I've gotten involved in discussions um, about the statutory religious education in schools. And um, I've got a daughter in school. And so, so kind of world religions is part of the curriculum in a, in a very different way. So even if my daughter doesn't have, who's, who's now 10, she doesn't have much of a sense of, I don't know, the rest of the world. She's quite insular, like most 10 year olds are. Mm -hmm. um she'll at least know that like Sikhs aren't the same as Muslims aren't the same as Jews <laughs> um, she's at least got that into her head um, so I, I yeah I'd want to advocate for um just a lot more everyday discussion not being afraid to talk about what people believe I think that there's a there's a way that we use belief particularly in the media very commonly to designate an other Mm -hmm. um and then to make this big blanket um generalization like because they're this labeled other um and which which labeled other you pick depends on which in group you are more than any evidence on the outside and so i think i think as a global culture in the media and as scholars we need to be much um much more sharp at drawing people to evidence of who exactly are these others that you're talking about and what, what evidence do you have to back that up yeah, I would agree with that completely. I think um, in some ways, the um, our fear in the United States or our uh, our legal separation between, uh, you know, the religious and the secular that prevents us from um, having public education until really higher ed on um, on, you know, just different beliefs in a kind of historical from a historical world religions perspective. Um, you know, and we could get into the critiques about about the world religions paradigm, but I think you have to you have to build the tower before you can break it down, right? Um, and so the the ability to acknowledge um, the social other that links back to Candace's point, I think, at the end of what she was just saying before, that the, somehow in the United States we seem unable to conceive of of our 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 own ourselves as as terrorists right we always have to find uh, a scapegoat or an other and so it's convenient to point to um, groups that we don't understand particularly because uh, you know there is such a strong lack of education it seems to me um, which I think is also related to the new AAR religious literacy guidelines that we could talk about in, in respect to all of this yeah. I've not actually read those. I should go and read them. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically just that the point of um, of uh, of our of our field and of our discipline, or that that we should be responsible as scholars for you know um, uh, fostering some kind of religious literacy, of some kind of understanding of our of our social others. Um, yeah, that's that's more or less the the absolutely agree agree to that and and inform spin working on that for, for quite some time, um, which, which kind of brings me into an, another of these kind of attributing others is the, the tendency to, um, to, to doubt the most apparent explanations. So, so depending on which facts, which news you're reading, the, the people who stormed the Capitol are um, right-wing um, terrorists, or they might be Antifa um, plants or they might be um, Iranians and how do you know who these people are um, so on the one hand it's it's about identity and where you're reading your news um, but on the other hand I, I wanted to um, kind of link it to some of these ideas of um, how if you're from a minority community or if you experience yourself as a persecuted in some way so a lot of um, a lot of evangelical Christians experience themselves as a persecuted minority. Um, you, you're likely to, um, and you've had some bad experiences with authority, you're likely to generalize that in different ways and to kind of 
briefly change the subject completely, there's been news stories here in Britain um, about the low take up of vaccines among um, minority ethnic communities, particularly Muslims and um, Hindus, and to some extent um, that there were also Jewish communities um, on like WhatsApp groups, um, stories about pork and beef and um, gelatin um, being perhaps in, in the vaccines. And there's been a huge information campaign and it's becoming a, a issue of, is it freedom of religion or freedom of belief to, um, or, or is it censorship to try to squash these rumors of what's in a vaccine, what's not in a vaccine. And I think we're really on the boundaries of these different competing freedoms that um, most Western societies um, hold as primary um, kind of rallying point. But I think also what's important is that the, these communities have good reasons to be doubtful. So the, the flu vaccine my daughter was given in school had pork in it, and they did say it has pork in it. So it's not an, an ungrounded fear. Um, <laughs> and if your government has lied to you before, why should you believe them now? Right. I was looking at um, when you had shared that article with us earlier, I had looked a little bit um, more into some of these information, disinformation, misinformation <laughs> campaigns related to vaccines and what might or might not be in them. Um, and I was thinking about, uh, first of all, I saw some some reports that um, some non-faith based anti-vaccine campaigns had also looked to kind of absorb some of these religious quote unquote, protestations in order to kind of hijack and promote anti-vaccine behavior as well, which I think is, is kind of a different side of it. So that on the one side, absolutely, there's the, you know, genuine concern over, you know, if gelatin's involved or if other um, animal products might be involved. And then on the other side, sort of seeing people trying to use that religious language to, to hype up um, people that are coming from places that aren't necessarily tied to quote unquote religious communities. Um, and so I think that that's a really interesting perspective. And then um, something else that I've been seeing, especially in Muslim communities, sort of, especially after the onset of the pandemic, where there were many changes that had to happen regarding just ritual practice. So related to, um, you know, prayer and going to mosque and, and not going on Hajj and not traveling and things like that. Um, that generally ethical arguments will vie for the good outweighing the bad. And so there's a moral obligation in the effort to save lives over um, even, you know, perhaps a minuscule amount of something that would otherwise be haram. And so um, those are more, you know, sophisticated kind of detailed conversations that obviously get missed when you see like, you know, Muslims and Jews are rejecting the vaccine because of their ideology or something like that. Um, so that's kind of what I've been seeing in a more detailed way in that, in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and I think, I mean, I think this, the, these questions about vaccines and misinformation and belief and, and religious freedom, right. Should like, to what extent is it acceptable to reject the the vaccine um, on on religious freedom grounds, right? Where does the state's concern for public health um, and 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 the necessity for respecting religious freedom begin? Um, you know, and and what kind of information and how what kind of information is being disseminated about the vaccines and how? Um, I think all of these questions are just so so fascinating and it like bring up they bring up a lot of questions for me as a student of of you know of religion and religious studies um about just kind of you know the balance between state power and um and and respect for various religious groups and beliefs and also do can we draw a distinction between what is an acceptable religious belief versus what is a harmful conspiracy theory or a harmful spread of misinformation? Like where can we draw those lines? Should we draw those lines? Who should be responsible for those kinds of things? Um, and I would be really interested to hear your thoughts as people who are um, folks who are farther along than me in your careers, if you've had, if you've given any thought to these questions or what your, what your feelings are about them. 
Well, from the my, the perspective of my many years of working with Inform, is that the, there's a line at which harm in the real world is caused. So if you're inciting violence directly against a group of people, um, that is speech which um, should be limited um, in British law for the for the greater good. And personally, I think that that's a, a kind of really important line in principle is is where it's not it, it's something that's advocating action um that is harmful um but of course uh, there's a lot of gray areas here and it's really hard to get the balance right at all times and when you push something into um censorship it often just amplifies the message in formats that are harder to regulate so i think one has to be very very careful with censorship but the, the the mainstream media has been has had a position of, of moderation of checks and balances of libel lawsuits and editorial control and it's not unbiased but there's a kind of we, we kind of know what, what the biases of most mainstream media and in social media we don't have that kind of checks and balance system yet and we're getting these really like the blanket bans from twitter um do seem slightly over the top and arbitrary, but there's not a good mechanism for a more subtle, um, a more subtle way of of moderating them as yet. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say um, that made me think of when you kind of brought up sort of moderating social media as news, um, which I'm as guilty as anyone of sort of using it as, in some ways, my news aggregator. And part of that is the you know sort of circle that I've built of people that I trust to kind of supply me with information. Um, and that can kind of lead to its own issues. Um, and one of my colleagues who's a cognitive scientist, her name is Dr. Nadia Brashier. She's been working on um, research related to how people process truth in, especially in media and sort of why certain generations are more susceptible to kind of false news or, or different realities that just aren't true. And part of it comes with um, partially like not being able to distinguish between different types of news sources. So on a Facebook feed, for example, being able to see that, um, you know, a CNN article might look similar to an article from just somebody's blog, and it's difficult to kind of see visually what the difference might be. Um, and so I think that all those kinds of things in social media kind of level the playing field in not always a positive way as far as how people can filter out what's what's good and bad. And so I think that, um, you know, as as I'm a teacher um, and we're all kind of in that type of profession as well, I definitely think that that media awareness and being able to, um, you know, read sources carefully is just an essential feature of of living in this age and being able to sort of know what you know. Um, so is this, um, what are the generation, what are the demographics of being able to read? Yeah, so work? a lot of it, um, so I don't want to kind of claim her work. Um, she's an amazing person and one of my, um, one of my friends, but she's, she's been working on issues of especially boomers and kind of older generations of, of trusting their acquaintances and circles more so that it's it's kind of the thing where you wouldn't think that your friend would tell you something false. Why would your Facebook friend post something that wasn't true? Um, you trust them. And so there's a trust that builds within um, your social circle as it gets smaller um, and so that it can increase then the amplification of, of falsities because of um, because you trust your circle more, but then that, yeah, it's a feedback loop related to then not being able to easily distinguish between kind of proper news sources and then memes or doctored images or, or things like that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm curious as to, because at the Open University, I don't teach um, traditional undergraduates usually. It's more at a distance and it's more adult learners. And we, we definitely try to instill these kind of critical thinking skills. But what do you see amongst um, kind of traditional undergraduates, like the under 25s? Are they much better at distinguishing digital information now than they might have been 10 or 15 years ago? Let's see. I mean, I'm trying, you know, because I, again, I, you know, I'm definitely teaching kind of traditional undergraduate ages. 
Um, and I do a lot of media projects with them. Um, most of my religion courses have some sort of um, reading the news component where they compare some kind of um, news sources on a particular event, and then they sort of see what the different sources say about that. And most of them are able to do that, which I think just means that they're able to understand that you know four different news sources might offer four different perspectives on quote unquote the same event. Um, so I think they're generally pretty good at it. I just think that they don't often like read the news as much as we might think they do. Um, so that's kind of my impression, but Savannah, you might be a little closer, um, especially in your, if you're a TA or anything like that, I'm not sure, um, to that as well. Yeah. So I guess I'm a little closer in terms of like age and TAing, and also I have, um, a uh, bunch of younger brothers who are all in the in Gen Z. Um, so I I think I would say that um, Candice, you're you're exactly right that they're not necessarily reading the news. Uh, it seems to me that they're getting their news more frequently through things like TikTok or um, Snapchat. You know, their social media that's that's popu- more popular among those age groups. Um, but I guess because these App, these apps are are accessible globally. They they seem to be getting more. Um, they have access to more global perspectives. It seems to me, um, and so they are perhaps more used to having access to lots of different ways of seeing the world or perceiving information um, than than perhaps the boomer generation would be. And it does seem that the the younger generations have a much more inclusive um, understanding of race, which might tip things that have been so in the news in the last year um, as the generation shifts over. Um, and I'm just thinking of the the um, the case stands um, pranks against Trump and in, in, <laughs> in favor of Black Lives Matter, and that's kind of an unprecedented political use of social media um, by people who are largely unpolitical, really. That's an old news story. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I think um, no. I think you're absolutely right. I think it it opens up avenues for them to be political in ways that perhaps uh, you know certainly when I was growing up before you know when I was in grade school before um, you know social media was really a thing. Um, I would say we we didn't have as widespread access to what was going on globally. We just kind of had to take the word of our you know, teachers or our friends or our parents, we had to kind of take them at their word the same way that Candace was discussing earlier in terms of how um, how boomers just kind of believe that their friends on social media are posting things that are trustworthy. And I think um, just really quickly to connect that back to some of the political stuff that we were talking about earlier and the stuff related to the Capitol riots, you know, we saw a big presence of of um, people who are, you know, who follow QAnon, the conspiracy theory mm-hmm. that's recently been coming into the news. Um, and it seems to be, it, seem, it seems to me from what I've been gathering in my own research on QAnon, that uh, it, it does seem to be the boomer generation that is more susceptible um, to, the, to the conspiracy theories um, or, and or folks who um, don't have as uh, who live in more rural areas, right, and don't have as much access to the kind of cultural centers um, of the U.S. or or even um, across across the ocean in the U.K. Um, it it does seem to be uh, again that same like they know a friend who fell down the the Q rabbit hole and they and they went ahead and followed. I mean, what I found interesting about the 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 what's the rabbit hole here is it has been in some some news stories like um, Susanna Crockford, an old colleague, did a, a recent religion dispatches piece, which is really good on the con spirituality of this new age um, components of people who are or who have also gotten interested in the the QAnon message and the overlaps, like with the skepticism of, of big pharmaceutical companies for which there are many reasons to be evidence-based skeptical of some of what they put out. Um, but the, um, yeah, so, so it's, not, it's not limited to the right or the left. Um, and this 
fear of uncertainty of of freedoms being curtailed um and and i think to some extent in a, it's it is a generational thing i think it's it's really fascinating um and i i think that's that might be a nice link to the the qanon shaman um which had some really fascinating news in the last week yeah so the qanon shaman um he was present at the capitol hill riots and he's actually a a younger uh, a younger man um he uh goes by jake and jelly uh which is his stage name he's actually a voice actor um but his uh his uh his uh, actual name is also uh, Jacob Chansley. Um, and there's been some recent uh, news that he has been asking President Trump for a pardon because he was, you know, he, his face was all over the news. He was arrested, you know, after the riots on the 6th. And um, he he asked President Trump to pardon him. Uh, and in a, in conversations with his lawyer, his lawyer had stated that, um, you know, that that Chansley was was an ardent believer. He's an ardent believer in QAnon and he sees Trump kind of as his his demagogue. Right. And so when Trump said, you know, when Trump incited some of that violence outside the Capitol and said, you know, and, and encouraged his supporters to, to go down to the Capitol and to fight, um, you know, it, Chansley, at least through his lawyer, seems to feel that uh, uh, because he's an ardent believer, he should be protected also um, under, under religious freedom. And, and this kind of actually links back to, um, some of the, the older, like brainwashing cases, right. From the satanic panic back in the 1980s. Um, like this idea that, um, you can, you can be brainwashed into a certain type of belief into following a a kind of, uh, cultic leader in a sense. Um, and, uh, Saw the um, uh, a posting towards Rick Ross, the kind of uh, arch deprogrammer of the 1980s, trying to give people advice about how to deprogram their relatives from QAnon <laughs> theories. Oh wow! It's just not um, it's not the same. <laughs> right I want to turn it over to Candace it looks uh Candace it looks like you had something you want to say oh yeah I was just going to connect with um that interview that you had shared with us which I'm sure we'll link all of this um it was an interview between the lawyer as you mentioned of Jacob Chansley and Chris Como who's a CNN anchor and as you mentioned you know they were kind of going back and forth over what Jacob believed and if it was true um and a, a notable quote I had written down from that interview was Trump was, quote, a man he loved. Um, And then Chris Cuomo would reply with things like, okay, whatever, and kind of push out of that and sort of disregard the, A, the possibility that Jacob Chansley could truly have either love, compassion, care for the persona of uh, the soon-to-be former President Trump. Um, And and then, you know, the, the news anchor is kind of, sure, okay, whatever, he's a shaman, but what did he do? And he always kind of did this move of, of pushing away the possibility, whereas, you know, as religious studies scholars, we have to be able to entertain the possibilities of that practice of belief. We might find something different later, but we have to be ready to at least consider taking him at his word. Is he truly a disciple of Trump? Is that something one can be? Um, as Suzanne brought up with the various news sources and kind of how you got your news. And, um, you know, you had shared with us an article, something like, you know, well, did Antifa really do it if that's how your worldview is positioned um, or if that's what your news sources are telling you? So I guess for me, it was the in- inability or the unwillingness of that particular news anchor to potentially entertain that Jacob Chansley could be some sort of true believer in something um, was was really unsettling for me in a way that I'm still figuring out how to explain. Yeah, I think that I think yeah, I would agree completely. I think it was really interesting the the kind of distinction we saw in that interview between um, you know like the 
first of all, between belief and action, which is something we talk about a lot in religious studies, right? The distinction between religious belief versus the actions that come from that or uh, lead to that. And then, of course, um, also the the distinction between, you know, okay, so is Jacob Ansley a gullible fool? Is he is he just a a member of a conspiracy theory or is he an ardent believer of a, a new upcoming religion? Um, and I think, you know, as I see that I'm, I'm looking at the time and I see that we're running out of time, I think this is um, a great place to kind of bring up some concluding thoughts about um, how these kinds of things that are coming up in the political arena um, affect the way that we as, um, well, first of all, as researchers, right, as uh, academics and students of the study of religion, but also as as educators, um, of the academic study of religion, what what do these kinds of stories mean for us um, going forward in our work and how we approach our our research and our teaching? I mean, for me, I think that the really important insights that you both brought out of this interview, which, which um, is definitely worth a watch, hopefully you can post a link to it, um, have to do with this misunderstanding of what religion is and that religion is is a, religioning is about um, the act of creation of of meaning, and just because you don't you're not following what an officially verified religious leader has um, decreed doesn't mean you're not truly and sincerely trying to create a religious worldview, and it's something that that we all do. And so, the the brushing him off as a fool, I think, comes from a, a really deep fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of what it is to be religious. Or what it is to be human, in fact. Well, you put that in a wonderful way. I don't want to follow that, but it was just so <laughs> succinct and lovely. Um, the the thing that I'll just mention here is that I think that um, gender has come up in a lot of interesting ways for me in the discussion of this more recent um, political moment that we're in. Well, I mean, forever gender has been a thing, but um, but especially. Um, Suzanne, you shared with us this article about the conspirituality. And I was thinking about, you know, sort of the female dominated new ageness and the male dominated realm of conspiracy theories that that particular article had offered and sort of seeing this meshing um, between them. And I think that that's something that I want to, to do more with, like what religious practices and political practices and rhetorics get gendered in different ways. and. And what does that say about how we understand and categorize, how we make value judgments about what's good and bad or what's proper religion or proper politics? Um, and when is it that something that's feminized is seen as, um, as not good politics or not good religion or vice versa in the case of the particular Como interview where the lawyer time and time again was trying to be like, he's a gentle guy. He's calm. He's not violent. He's not one of those people. Um, so I think being aware and kind of having your religious studies, like, you know, sort of grasp on that, um, with that gender kind of focus can really help nuance a bit how people are categorizing good and bad religion or good and bad politics. Yeah, I think that uh, both of your insights, um, thank you so much for them. And I, I would definitely agree wholeheartedly. I think it, just to end on kind of a, a lighthearted note, uh, I was, I had posted the, uh, a link to one of these articles on my Facebook page recently. And, um, we, uh, we were talking about, you know, how, how certain, uh, groups are, are categorized in certain ways, um, classified in certain ways. Is it a religion? Is it, is it a conspiracy? What's the difference? And a friend of mine who was uh, also a religious studies major in undergrad posted back, hey, when your religious studies degree comes in handy. Um, And I think that, uh, you know, I think that we as religious studies folks, as students and scholars, we have a lot to offer um, to our students and to the wider public um, and to each other about uh, just different kind of ways of, of, coming to understand some of these situations and how deeply complex uh, they truly are. Um, I want to, 
uh, tie us up because I see we are out of time. So Candace and Suzanne, thank you so much again for, for joining me today. This has been such a pleasure and I really appreciate your willingness to kind of talk about some of these um, contentious issues and to turn your, your eyes away from the, from the uh, live feed of Biden's inauguration today uh, for us to do this. So thank you so much. It's Not a pleasure. Problem. Thank it you. It was awesome. Thanks. Take care. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's the other guy. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox and Lauren Osborne and our Opportunities Digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, podcast transcription by Andy Alexander and Savannah Finver, and social media managed by Ray Radford and Candice Mixon. Don't forget you can support the project by using our Amazon affiliate links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and other portals. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>